This is what I'm seeing in the sources, that they are very open to this diversity Mm -hmm. and also even... I, I told you when we last chatted. So I'm waiting for I you find, to tell the story. Yes. I'm, find, I'm trying to get you to tell the story yes, about the woman and her ketubah. Yeah, exactly. This is um, this, this is the um, pinnacle of the entire conversation because it's such a profound expression of diversity. I, I was shocked. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Voices. I'm here today with Dr. Nadia Vidro of University College London. So here you have a letter from the year 416, which, um, or... Or sorry, four seventeen, which and that is, is that the, the Islamic. Hijra. Okay, so what is that in the Gregorian uh, calendar uh, off the top of your? The, uh, it's not that easy to so, calculate. Okay, um, sometime in the tenth so, century or eleventh so century. Yeah, it so it's it'll be ten twenty so, somewhere around there. Okay, yeah. um, and it says this year was intercalated according to the, and I can't really see that there. The muayyidun and plain meaning not intercalated according to the kabbasun. So what are the Mu'ayi doing in the Kabbasun? Um, so these are two interesting terms as well. Um, kabisa means intercalated. So Kabbasun mm-hmm. are those who intercalate. And yeah. um, Aid means in Arabic festival. So Mu'ayyadun are those who okay. celebrate. All right. But those two terms, um, you don't see it in the... Uh, literal translation of the terms, but mm-hmm. they actually um, refer to how much barley you need to find. Okay. So there uh, are these two factions and they have names. Yes. Wow. For, 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 this, particular, for, this, for, for this particular issue. Okay. Um, and this probably uh, is because they go to the fields, they see the same barley, and for example, they agree on the stage, but they don't agree on how much you need to find. So okay. those who have found a little bit of this particular stage of barley, they'll celebrate. Okay. But those who say, no, this is not enough. This is just, maybe it's enough for a sheaf offering, but uh, it's not enough for... So so there's a question here, what quantity? Is it a plot? Is it a patch? Is it, is is it throughout it the entire country? Is it just one Omer? Or is, okay. Yeah, there's all those opinions that okay. you're mentioning are recorded in the books. Okay. Uh, usually wow. they'll say that uh, the whole country is unfeasible to check. So as, as long as we find a couple of yeah. sort of uh, fields... Mm-hmm. Uh, that are in the same stage, we can assume that probably this is yeah. uh, the whole country will be in the same stage. So uh, um, they're it, extrapolating from what they, they found. They, what they they're haven't they're found. extrapolating, okay. um, uh, but not from a small plot. From a number of fields, they can extrapolate to the okay. whole country, for example. So, but all those different opinions. But then there were other opinions you're saying where it was just a sheaf and that was enough. Yeah, is that right? sometimes, wow. okay. sometimes that so, because you need yeah. to to offer. One right, only. so that's the minimal based on their understanding of the biblical yeah. um, timeline. So, and then um, this is a bit off top, not really off topic. So, so you said it's not practical to go and look around the whole country. And I could tell you, having done it in the modern era with with multiple vehicles, and you know, and the, and and we're talking over the cell phone, and one vehicle's going down this road, and the other's going down that road, and we cover, um, you know, massive uh, well. Maybe not on American terms, but on Israeli terms, we're covering a large portion of the country, um, large sections. And I should say, when we first started out, we didn't even know where to look. We looked in like Samaria, we looked in in the Galilee, we looked all over the place, and we realized that the earliest ripening places are the Jordan Valley and the Northern Negev, and those are the exact spots that you that you mention here in in yeah, the this article. Is, this is that's disgusting. amazing. This is discussed in the sources where you should go. Sort of what are the limits of the land of Israel, but yeah. they're all only discussing the southern parts because they'll always say in the north yeah. it ripens late, so we don't need to be bothered with that. So you say the dis, and this is from your article in in the years four fifteen and four eighteen, and this is they're, they're just like today. I would use the Gregorian calendar, say it's twenty twenty two. Even though in the rabbinical calendar it's Tafshin Shin Pei Bet, and yeah, they're and, using you know, a lot of hijra. so they're using the hijra, which is because they're living in an Islamic dominated culture. So they say the years four fifteen and four eighteen um, that they uh, did barley inspections in the district of Gaza uh, near Rafiah, where Rafa uh, in four ten and four thirteen, and then the district of Tsoar in four sixteen. Which is that's the Jordan Valley. It's that's the southern the end of the Jordan Valley, Valley but it's many and, texts talk about and the Jordan district Valley. of Ramla. That's interesting because I would have thought Ramla is kind of a late ripening area, and the district of Ashkelon. Well, we we've there was one year where the main field we found was just south of Ashkelon. It's amazing. So we stumbled well, it's upon the same land of Israel. Yeah, right? well, that's true. Um, 
and look, I, I was aware of some of these reports, meaning there was one that was published by, I think, um, maybe Judith Schlanger or somebody like that mm -hmm. decades ago, right? So I knew that they were looking in the district of Gaza, right? So I thought maybe I'm cheating a little bit. There's nothing <laughs> I'm cheating. I found on, on my own, not just me, but other people I was involved with, that the northern Negev, that was the place where it would ripen, one of the places it would ripen early. And then that was confirmed by the, one of these reports, um, which I think is included in, in your article um, as well. So um, it's fascinating, right? So, so it's the same sorts of areas. Tsoar is interesting. Do you know what they meant by Tsoar? Tsoar is the southern end of the Dead Sea. There's no barley there today. But if you go, I don't know, a half an hour north by car, well, yeah, there's a whole lot of barley there. So did they literally mean Tsoar? Uh, well, that's what they write. That's what they write. Okay. That's what they write, and a number that's and a number of they they discussed if Tsor is actually um, a good place to check, but not not necessarily only mm. in agricultural terms, but yeah. also in biblical terms. Whether this belonged ah. to the land of Israel and okay. and and what they meant by Tsor was somewhere on the southern end of the Dead Sea. We've yeah. got the tombstones from Tsor. Yeah. That mention uh, the Shemitah, incredible tombstones, documents there. Um, so, and I guess they must have been involved in some sort of agriculture. And look at Qumran, they found sickles, which are on display at the Israel Museum. And that blew my mind. Like, who's growing crops here in the Dead Sea Valley? But um, I guess the Dead, not guess, I know the Dead Sea used to be higher. And then the water table was higher. So that may have affected it as well. Um, I, I, I want to talk about these statements in, in uh, one of these letters here. Um, let's talk about this here. You um, quote how, like, there's people by name. Uh, here it says, On Tuesday, a field was inspected on which there was abundant grain. The majority of it was green and doughy. That's that technical term there. And the pistachio colored was beginning to spread. The community did not agree on the opinion that the festival was in Safar. And Safar here means... It's the Muslim is, oh, it's the, Okay, they're using the Muslim names for the months. And why are they doing that? It's it's obvious to me why they're doing that. If I say, you know, Nissan, well, when I think Nissan is, that might be different than when you think Nissan Absolutely. is. I think that's, so, so we need some kind of, just like today, we'll say, you know, March 22nd, right? Yeah, to have a, a it, common grid. Exactly, right. Uh, and it says, the teacher Abu Said and many in the community intercalated. So so there was a dispute that year, and it sounds like almost every year, um, you bring one year where there wasn't a dispute, but there are all these different <laughs> years where there... Um, um, there was a, often a split in the community yeah. where some part of the community decided to intercalate and the, uh, another part of the community decided that the uh, um, barley was ripe enough mm -hmm. to actually celebrate Passover. And that means that for the course of this year, they were a month apart. They celebrated all the festivals yeah. a month apart. Um, yeah. And you didn't always have to stick with the same group. Um, in oh, this, really? Yeah. In this so tell me about that. Uh, in the, um when I analyze this chronicle, yeah. this logbook of intercalation, you yeah. can see that um, sometimes a part of a group that in the previous year were together, um, and then there was a second group that did something different. One part of this first group would split mm -hmm. and join the second group, and then in the next uh -huh. year uh, make the, the, the decision, join with the second group because they... Um, thought that this year Sevi was ready to and, celebrate. And could that be so, because so there were three factors? It could be that maybe some of the factors lined up for that group this year. Um, do you think? Maybe, so we had quantity, location, and what was the third one? Uh, um, well, location was more or less oh, agreed. Oh. So quality, uh, quality, amount, and time. Okay, so it's the stage of the ripening, whether it has to be by the beginning of the month or... Uh, well, what was the other opinion? Um, before Passover. Passover, okay. Every so, sort of, you, you always need to know yeah. before Passover. So let's let's dwell on that for a second. So one of the factions, and this is literally today one of the disputes that's going on. So so this is incredible. Um, so there was one group that said, you're, according to what you're saying in the 10th, 11th century, you have to have the Aviv before the beginning of the month. And the other said, no, it's fine. We can go 14 days into the month as long as it's by what would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Chag Matzot, and if it's not, then we wait till the next month. That, those that's were the... precisely the opinion. Wow! That's and this is the 10th, the 11th century. That's precisely and... the opinion. I think the beginning of the month was winning because it was much more practical, mm -hmm. but you still see people arguing for the 40, sort of up to 14 and, days. And they weren't just arguing, they were observing based on that, right? It, it seems to me so, yeah. So it here you have so. uh, the majority celebrated the festival in the middle of Muharram, of this year, 
for the teacher Abu Sa'id and for those who intercalated the previous year with him, this year was plain, meaning not intercalated. They didn't add a 13th month. They didn't but, need to. <laughs> but Abu al Taib. Uh, Shalom intercalated this year after intercalating the one before. So. Yeah, sometimes you have those sequences of two intercalated okay. years, which oh. is unheard of. So and they did have two years in a row that, that, that had 13 months. That, that happened. Happen. There, there, there is a discussion about this. Okay. Well, there's a discussion about everything, basically. So is there a discussion, or do we have a practical example where they said this happened? Uh, here, you see a practical example of this one teacher, Abu Taib. Uh, is this Abu Taib? Yeah, He's Abu Taib. Intercalated yeah. this year after intercalating yeah. the one. Okay. Yeah. So so, so it's a two in a row. Yeah. According yeah. to Abu Abu Al Taib Shalom. Yeah. I love that the, name. He's got the Arabic first name, but yeah. his last name is Shalom. Yeah. You have those sequences of two intercalated years. I okay. don't know how how um, co uh, how much that happened, mm -hmm. but it definitely happened. So you've got whether it has to be by the first or the fifteenth. You've got which of the three. Fourteenth, not fifteenth. Fourteenth. Fourteenth. Okay. Well. You have, to have it by the, you have to have it by the 14th, so the 15th can be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Sorry, that's what I meant. Um, so you have to have it by the 14th or the 1st. You have to decide whether it's one of these three stages. And then you have to decide how much is it, whether it's a patch that produces two omers or an omer, or whether it's all over the land and maybe something in between. So those are the three main factors. And so how did they, how did they function? with? Because, I mean, some people would look at this and say, this is, we say in Hebrew, balagan. This is this is this is impractical to have a community when you have all these differences and disagreements, and even one one part of a faction may side with the other faction. And and how how did this? Um, so uh, as I said, they were very open to diversity. Mm -hmm. um, how exactly that ran um, mm -hmm. in practice? Um, it's a little bit difficult to imagine. One mm -hmm. thing that helped me to understand what happened yeah. there was uh, when I when I read that. Um, for example, um, they didn't necessarily have one synagogue for everyone. It, mm -hmm. They just had small private places of study and worship. Okay. So if you wanted to celebrate those festivals with the group, maybe you just did it in your little private place of study and worship. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other groups who made different decisions um, went to other studies uh, went to other places of worship. Or, but, but think of the you ramifications. Didn't have, you, so. didn't, you didn't have to share one single synagogue. Okay. So, so that's so, one. So some of the ramifications could be, um, you know, Abu Ataib, he, um, he has his shop open on, on you know, Sunday. And um, who's the other guy? Abu Said says, no, Sunday is a feast. What are you doing? You're violating uh, the holiday. But they were able to... Um, um, to, that to was a right. That was a right. For so they, them. so that they tolerated right that. that. They tolerated that. So this they, is a profound level of tolerance you wouldn't expect. In particular, you wouldn't expect it in Judaism, uh, which historically wasn't all that particularly tolerant um, of, of of diversity of. It was, I think Judaism was tolerant of diversity of thought, not diversity of action. Um, so Karaites, uh, it seems to me Karaites are different in this sense. Uh, I could say today we strive to be, but aren't always successful. <laughs> um, but but is that what you're seeing in the sources? This is what to... I'm seeing in the sources, okay. that they are very open to this diversity. Mm -hmm. And also even, I, I told you when we last chatted. So I'm waiting for I you find, to tell the story. Yes. I'm, find, I'm trying to get you to tell the story yes, about the woman and her ketubah. Yeah, exactly. This is, um, this, this is the um, pinnacle of the entire conversation. Because <laughs> it's such a profound expression of diversity. I, I was shocked. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I found this one passage in the mm -hmm. Book of Commandments by Levi ben Yefet, who is mm -hmm. the 11th, 11th century, early 11th century scholar, mm -hmm. where he talks about vows made by women mm -hmm. um, in relation to Numbers 30, I think. Numbers mm -hmm. 30, this um, um, uh, chapter in the Bible, um, where it, the Bible says that um, a father or husband are allowed to override a woman's vow. Mm -hmm. Essentially, uh, if if he hears about it on the day he hears about it, he could say, "I cancel that vow," or something like this, and then the vow is null and void. Yeah, but what Levi Ben Yefet says is yeah. that in important things that are actual commandments, that are actual religious obligations, if a woman decides to, in a year when there is disagreement about the festival, yeah. festivals in within the Karait community, yeah. if a woman decides that she wants to celebrate with one group and her husband actually um, um, 
is of a different opinion and sides with another group, he is not allowed to stop her from following the calendar that she chose, that she wow. sided with. So, so she's allowed to follow her conscience and her husband can't invalidate her decision. That's it. Wow. Because he says wow. um, obligations are different from um, other vows. So in other words, what, what the Torah is talking about in Numbers, I think, generally thought is the woman says, I'm not going to eat you know, green vegetables on Tuesday. And the husband hears this and he says, no, that's, I invalidate that. Or he's silent and that stands, right? Yeah. Um, and, he, and what Levi uh, Ben Yefet is saying is, well, that's voluntary things. If it's something that, that's actually a commandment, she can follow her conscience and her husband has no say in it. Is that, is that what, what it says? This is, this is what it says. This is what so, it says. So is this some, okay, so I, I'm going to, I'm just thinking out loud here. So is this like some level of feminism that we wouldn't have expected from Judaism in the 11th century? Or, or what is this? Um, I think it's definitely a level of tolerance that we mm -hmm. probably don't think existed. Mm -hmm. Or we didn't realize uh, existed. We didn't realize existed. Okay. Um, I don't know if it spreads to enough areas to call this feminism. Okay. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> And that's beyond my expertise as well. So, um, so all right. So you have this this tolerance where even a husband and wife can decide we're going to observe the fe feast on a different day or a different month. We'll get to day in a minute, um, hopefully. Um, certainly, even in a different month, and that is that's accepted. They don't get divorced. They don't split up. That he has to accept what she's doing and respect it, it sounds like. Yeah, that's within the that's Karait incredible. community. Right. But we also see the same thing bet between Karaites and Rabbanites, because mm -hmm. uh, in the period we're talking about, Karaites and Rabbanites were allowed to marry each other. They, mm -hmm. weren't, um, uh, they weren't forbidden from doing this, and we mm -hmm. definitely see marriages like this. And those, in those marriages, there are special clauses. Mm -hmm. um, about festivals and how they should mm. uh, how they should treat those festivals that sometimes don't fall in the same months because mm. one will follow the Rabbanite calendar and the other the Karait calendar or one of the Karait calendars <laughs> one of the Karait calendars. <laughs> okay, and so they they always insert a clause where um, that stipulates that they'll mutually tolerate each other's festivals and wow. will not desecrate each other's festivals. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been an amazing conversation. We're going to come back. And we're going to talk about more about the calendar, about the new moon, and how that was observed. Thank you. Thank you. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.